Welcome to my neighborhood. I've been living in Geneva for about 25 years, and I've realized, and I've heard this quote from a staff person at Chapel Street, serving is the new currency in the kingdom of God. So often we think of serving as something that is big. You have to sign up for it. It's a program. More often than not, it's doing the little things. It's seeing a need and meeting it. And it's not that difficult. There are opportunities like that in our neighborhoods all over the place. Chapel Street exists for the community and for the gospel. And it's why we've put together the Neighborhood Serve 2022. We've collaborated with our community and identified 14 relationships that are really special in and around our four campuses. So these are places where you can join with Chapel Street and our special partners to make an impact for where you are. When you do that, it's those serving opportunities that begin to change our hearts. I'm admittedly a selfish person, yet Jesus' words tell us that he came to serve rather than be served. So that influences my life. I want to be more like Jesus. I want Chapel Street's people to join me in being more like Jesus. So we serve. We do it together. We have a lot of fun while we do it. And that's why we created Neighborhood Serve 2022, an opportunity for you and me to make an impact for where we are in our communities, with our partners, and with our neighbors. So at the end of the day, why do we do Neighborhood Serve? We do it to make an impact in our community, but our greatest desire is to see each person that calls Chapel Street their church, to be transformed from the inside out by the work of the Holy Spirit, because serving changes lives. Join us in this process of being transformed by Jesus. Well, we talk about this a lot as a church, how, how we want to be a place for where you are, a place that makes an impact in the lives of our neighbors and in our communities and in, our, uh, in the towns in which we live. And so we do want to, enjoy, to invite you to join us for Neighborhood Serve 2022. There's so many opportunities for you to get involved in everything from, from packing food at the Northern Illinois Food Bank to being a part of our Buddy Break program here at the church and even cleaning up the property at the Batavia Apartments. There's so many ways for you to get involved. And so today, I want to encourage you to consider what it might be for you. Where might God be leading you to serve and to sign up even now today? If you go to the uh, QR codes on the seat backs in front of you, if you scan that with your phone or if you're watching online, that should be up on the screen for you. You can sign up right now here in this service. Or you can go onto our website and look at all of the options available. You can go to chapelstreet.church slash NS22 to do that. Our hope is to see every campus mobilized to serve their neighborhoods and every family, every family mobilized to serve their neighbors. And so we hope that you're able to join us in this great work that we get to do. Today, we're uh, continuing in our By Faith series that we have started the last couple of weeks. We're going to uh, pray for our time in God's Word in just a moment. Before we do, um, I'm sure many of us have heard about or been tracking with uh, the recent uh, news, the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and, and the ongoing debate that has been uh, part of that. Um, we know for many this is a hot button issue, but, but as a church, uh, we have always believed that, that to be pro-life is a gospel term and not just a political one. We believe that uh, our goal has always been to pray for and to support the vulnerable and the weak, to stand for the unborn and also for the mothers that carry them. Many of you remember that, that uh, we last year partnered with the Caring Network. Uh, we've been partnering with ministries like this for, for a long time now, but last year we, we came together and we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to partner with this ministry that comes alongside of and encourages and loves uh, women that are dealing with unexpected or unwanted pregnancies and, and gives them resources and a non-judgmental way to choose life, loving them with the love of Christ no matter what. Our ultimate hope in any issue, but specifically as we talk about this issue and as we uh, look at this important legal action, is that our hope is not in any legal system, but our hope is in creating a culture of life that the gospel teaches and commands us to be a part of. And so let's pray for the state of our nation, and let's pray for our time as we open up God's word. Jesus, today we, we thank you for this time, and, and we do pray for our nation. God, we do pray for our leaders 
We pray for the future of our country that, that you have placed us in that we care about. But Lord, we also pray that we as a church might be a witness in our world. Lord, that we will be light in darkness, that we would stand for, for the vulnerable, that we would care about these things because you care about them. Lord, we do pray for those that are afraid or, or angry or dealing all, all sorts of emotions. Lord, we know that you have called us to be salt and light, to, to speak truth, but to do so in love. And so allow us to do that. Allow us to be that witness each and every day. God, we do pray for us now as we open up your word that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you would guide us closer and closer to you each and every day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, like I said, we're continuing in our series by faith as we uh, begin this time together. I'm, I'm curious um, if you have ever uh, done something, if you can think of a time where you did something knowing that there would be people that didn't understand. Recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife Judy and I, we celebrated our seventh wedding anniversary. Uh, seven years, she hasn't gotten sick of me yet, praise the Lord. Um, we, and we were both young, we were both 23 years old when we got married, which for our generation is considered pretty young, and, and we knew going into it that there would be people that didn't understand. Sure enough, we had friends that would come to us and, and would ask us why we would do that, why we didn't want to go out and be adventurous in our 20s and, in, and enjoy the nightlife. And, and if you know me at all, you know that it takes all of my energy just to get through the day life. I don't need nightlife. Um, but for some people, it just didn't make sense. The most surprising one, though, was when I called my grandparents to tell them the good news. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where, where you've been talking with someone, and, and the, the call ended, and the person on the other end of the call thought they hung up and didn't, and then started talking about you. Does that ever happen? <laughs> it has for me. And so we do this, you know, we're so excited for you, blah, blah, blah. And then they thought they hung up, and I heard my grandfather say, well, that was unexpected. <laughs> And then I heard my grandmother say, uh, wow, don't, they, don't you think they're a little young? And then I heard my grandfather say, oh, and he clicks. <laughs> and we never talked about it again. Today, though, we're, like I said, we're, we're back in this series looking at what it means to live by faith. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now, how this exploration of Hebrews 11 that we've been doing shows us all of these beautiful examples of faith. This chapter, sometimes referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame, has been walking us through these different people, and we'll be continuing to do this throughout the summer. Looking to the faith of people like Abraham and Sarah and Moses and so many others. And we saw this all the way back in our first week, this definition of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 1. That faith is not what so many people think that it is. Faith is not just blind faith, not just superstition, not just wishful thinking, but faith is assurance of things hoped for, substance, reality. And faith is also conviction, evidence of what is unseen. That faith is active. Faith is calling us to do what God has commanded us, knowing that there will be people that don't understand. This is the example of faith that we're given today as we look to the story of Noah. Noah's story is one that has drawn the attention of people throughout the years. A story that we see even today in art and TV and film of this man who shows uncommon faith, even in the midst of unparalleled evil. It's a story that whether or not you grew up going to church, you might have some familiarity with, uh, the ark and the animals and the flood. But today... Our goal is to look at this story through a particular lens, through the lens of faith, to examine what it is about Noah's life that shows us what it looks like to live by faith, what it was for Noah that allowed him to, and gave him the assurance that he could do whatever God told him to, even when the rest of the world did not understand what he was doing. And so we're going to start by looking at our Faith Hall of Fame chapter, and then we'll dive into Noah's story together. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says this, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So today... What we're going to do with the time that we have is we're going to look at Noah's life of faith 
his work of faith and his status as an heir of faith. We'll start with the life of faith. Back when I was uh, in college, I, I spent a summer working and living in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was working at a youth missions organization, and so each week we would have different youth groups come in, and we would send them out throughout the city to do different service projects. And, and so we would, uh, p- part of my job was just kind of coordinating all of this, and we would take these students out, and, and each week we would have up to 100 students. And so there was just a lot going on, and, and we would go out in these giant caravans where we had like six church vans and a bus, and, and it was just crazy. And I don't know if you've ever driven in Atlanta, but it makes the Chicago drivers seem like they know what they're doing, which is saying something. And so what we would do, this was around the time that we were still deciding if we trusted our GPSs. And so what I would do is I would go to the drivers and I would say, whatever happens, do not get far away from the car in front of you. Like go bumper to bumper. I don't care if you're running red lights or disrupting traffic and people are getting mad at you because I knew if we got separated, it was going to be impossible for all of us to get where we needed to be. I was reminded of that story when I was looking at the story of Noah. Look with me how it begins in Genesis chapter six. We'll start in verse uh, five. It says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. This is where Noah's story begins. In contrast to everything around him, living in this time where everything was evil, he was someone that did not belong to the world in which he lived. We see this in verse 5, that the entire world had turned away from God and his goodness and his love, and and they had turned towards continuous evil. That every thought, every intention, every action was filled with abuse and chaos and violence and destruction. This was evil far beyond what we see in our world today, as dark and as troubling as things might be. This was a world that was completely lost. Then we see God's response in verse 6, that he grieved, that his heart mourned over what had happened. Sometimes I think we struggle with stories like this. Sometimes it's easy to to struggle where if we're not careful, we can get this picture of God as nothing more than this vengeful and angry and judgmental guy that's just waiting for us to mess up so he can wipe us out. But here we see that in the face of complete evil, we see the heart of a father grieving over the choices that his children have made. We see a patient God waiting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years longing for them to come home. And it's into this world that Noah's story begins. And this is the first thing that we're told about Noah, that he found favor in the eyes of God. Noah found favor, that word sometimes translated as grace, the very first time we see it used in the Bible. In other words, God looked at Noah's life and he liked what he saw. He considered him righteous and blameless. Why? Look again at verse 9. Because he walked with God. Because he stayed as close as possible. He did not let anything get in the way of him and his walk with his heavenly father. It matters, I think, that this is where Noah's story begins. It matters for us when we might want to skip ahead to the parts that we know, to the ark and to the animals and to the flood. It matters that we start here because here we see that before Noah could work for God, he had to walk with God. Noah lived half of his life and nobody knew who he was. We're not told about anything that he did. No achievements, no accomplishments. We don't even know what his career was. This is all that we have, that Noah walked with God. That God was preparing him for something great. That he was, a, that he was doing a work in Noah before he would do one through Noah. And this is how faith works. Have you ever met someone who has just this incredible, strong, unmovable faith? 
Faith that remains even in the darkest moments. In every one of those people's lives, this is how faith was built. This is what faith is rooted in. A faith that walks every single day with God. This is the first lesson of faith that we see today. That Noah walked with God, even if that meant he was going to walk alone. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like at your workplace or in your classroom or on your street that you're the only one following Jesus? The only one living by faith. Well, no one knew that feeling. In fact, we're told that he and his family, they were the only ones. That everybody else had turned their backs on God. Think about the faith that they must have had. The faith to hold on to what they believe in. This, by the way, is one of the most important and greatest reasons for you to get involved in community. To get involved with people that know you and you know them. To encourage each other. To walk with each other as we grow closer to Jesus. Noah would have given anything to have this. And yet, even when he was the only one, he did not stop walking with God. William Penn puts it this way, that right is right, even if everyone is against it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is for it. This is what Noah believed. It's what he models for us today, that even when everyone else had turned away, By faith, he declared that even if I am the only one, and even if I have nothing else, I will not walk away from God because he is too good to let go of. Back when uh, Judy and I were engaged, uh, she experienced this a a little bit with the people at her job. They did not understand why two people that were engaged and planning their wedding weren't living together. It made no sense to them that we would both pay rent separately. That we would live our lives and orient our lives around God's teaching. In their minds, it made no sense to live by faith. To live what they considered this old-fashioned or outdated kind of life. But this is what faith does. It says, my goal is not to be accepted or even understood. My goal is to walk with God. To get as close to him as I can every single day. Not perfectly, not judging others that don't do what we do, not being weird just to stand out, not thinking that we're better than anybody else. Believe me, we aren't. But simply with the recognition that you cannot belong to Jesus and to the world. That if it feels like we don't belong, maybe it's because we don't. That we are living, as we see later in Hebrews 11 and verse 16, with a better home a better country, a heavenly hope in mind. What about you? Is it clear to the people in your life who you are walking with? Tony Evans puts it this way. He said, if you were accused of being a follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Back when I was uh, in middle school, I remember um, I was a youth group kid, and my middle school pastor was teaching us about evangelism, and, and he encouraged us to think about a friend that we knew that we could invite to our next big youth group outreach event. And so I started trying to muster up the courage to invite my friend uh, Jason. We were good friends, uh, but, but he seemed like someone that could use some Jesus in his life. You ever have a friend like that? Like, I love you, but you're kind of a mess. That was Jason. And so I'm trying to muster up the courage to do this, and I'm awkward, and I'm scared that he's going to think I'm weird. And and so while I'm trying to do this, one day he comes up to me, and he invites me to his youth group event. And apparently his middle school pastor had been doing the same thing, and he thought I was kind of a mess that needed some Jesus. (laughs) Now, we were really good friends. Like, we hung out all the time. And yet, there was absolutely no evidence that both of us were walking with Jesus. What evidence do we give to the people in our lives? Is there something different about how you spend your time and your resources? Something different about the words that you use? Something different about the way that you forgive and love and respond to the highs and the lows of your life? What evidence is there that we are walking with Jesus? This is Noah's life of faith. That brings us to a work of faith. A work of faith. I don't know um, about you. Whenever I think of the story of Noah, uh, I think of the first time I bought something from Ikea. 
Uh, I've come to believe that there are two types of people in the world. The first type is the person when they buy something from Ikea, they take all the pieces out and they open the instructions and they follow it one step at a time. And then there's the second type. The type of person that takes one picture at what it's supposed to look like and just starts doing stuff. And because this is a fallen world, those two people always end up marrying each other. (laughs) Now Judy and I learned this. I can't remember, I think it was like a dresser or something we bought, and and I remember just so clearly, by the time that I opened the instruction book, she was already four steps in. And I was so stressed at how reckless she was being, and she was so stressed at how slow I was going, and so now we just buy all of our furniture pre-assembled. That's just, that's a, amen, come on. A small price for a happy marriage. I wonder, though, if Noah felt that way when when God came to him and told him these words. Look at this next part of the story. We'll go back to Genesis 6, uh, pick it up in verse 12. It says, God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And then verse 22. Look at this beautiful, simple sentence. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Noah did all that God commanded him. This is what the author of Hebrews tells us about. Look again to uh, Hebrews 11 verse 7. We see this, that, that Noah was warned about events not yet seen, and he responded with action, with obedience, with reverent fear. The sense of being in awe of who God is and what he is capable of. And this is the evidence of Noah's faith in God. That even when God came to him and told him something that didn't make any sense at all, something that must have sounded absolutely crazy, that Noah does everything that God commands. And this is what the author of Hebrews is showing us, that active and living and growing faith in Jesus says yes to God's commands, even when they don't make sense, even when we don't understand them. It made no sense for Noah to do what he did. This was an incredible undertaking that God was calling him to, to construct this ark that was one and a half football fields long, three separate decks, enough space to carry thousands of animals. And here's the crazy thing. Noah didn't even live by water. There was no body of water near him. There had never been a flood. We don't even know if there had been rain. He wasn't a builder. No one had ever done this before. There are so many questions, so many excuses that he could have given, but this is what true, authentic, growing faith does. Faith starts building the ark. Not because there are clouds in the sky, because it trusts the ones that controls the heavens. Faith doesn't wait for the first raindrop, doesn't wait for everything to make sense, doesn't wait for every question to be answered. Faith doesn't need the whole instruction book. It goes on the picture that it has been given. And what a picture of faith that Noah gives us here. This moment where with all the questions that he must have had and all the doubts and all the confusion, he gets up and he cuts down that first tree. Friends, this is what it looks like to live by faith. It means stepping out in obedience. It means saying yes to God. It means responding to his commands even when we don't understand them. It means when you feel the Holy Spirit nudging you to reach out to a friend and offer to pray for them, it means actually doing it, even if it might feel weird. It means dealing with things in your life. It means forgiving someone even when the world tells you to hold a grudge. It means being louder about your commitment to Christ than your political party or your favorite sports team. It means going out as so many of our students have done these past few weeks all around the country and the world to be a light in the midst of darkness and to spread the gospel knowing that there will be people that just don't get it. It means enduring, as Noah did. 
when it seems like your faith isn't producing any fruit. We're told this at this point in history where people lived for hundreds of years, which might seem strange to us, and, and there are different theories and scholars that have explored this, and we don't have time to get, to get into all of that today. But, but we're told that 120 years went by between God's warning and the first drop of rain. 120 years of people laughing, scoffing, questioning, telling him that he was wasting his life. You don't think he had moments and days and weeks of doubt? Of course he did. And yet this is part of what faith is. Not the absence of doubt. Not refusing to ask God what his plans are or his timing is, but rather trusting that if he has brought me this far that I can trust that he will remain faithful because he has been faithful to me. Faith doesn't wait for everything to make sense. It doesn't wait to see the whole staircase, as Martin Luther King Jr. says. It takes the first step. It cuts the first tree. It says, as scary as what God is calling me to do, and as much as I don't know, and as much as this might cost me, and as afraid as I am of saying yes to God, I can't imagine where I would be if I say no. This is what Noah shows us. That truly living by faith could cost you everything. It did for Noah. It cost him his career, whatever it was. It cost him his time, his resources. It cost him his reputation. People thought he was crazy. And yet here's what we see is that even if faith might cost us everything, it is when we don't live by faith that it costs even more. That everything that God said would happen, happened. And the only one that was ready was the one that lived by faith. This is the point that the author of Hebrews is making. This is the faith that we are called to. A faith that does not give up when it is misunderstood or or critiqued or criticized. A faith that says, it doesn't matter that I've never built an ark before. Because I am walking with the architect. A faith that says, whatever it costs and whatever it takes me. I will not let anything get in the way of walking by faith. This brings us to our last part of the story. We see an heir of faith. Go back to Hebrews 11 uh, one more time with me, just the second part of the verse. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. In other words, this is what the author is saying, that he became an heir, that he inherited righteousness, that because of his faith, he became a child of God and inherited certain things. Protection, provision, promises, that that even in the midst of the storm, and even though he didn't have sails or a rudder or a steering wheel on that ark, that God led him to safety, that God protected him, even as the rain fell. There's a fascinating detail in the story all the way back uh, in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 6. Let me read this again. Verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now pitch was this tar-like substance that that would have been put in between the planks of wood. It was kind of like waterproof uh, to, to keep the waters out, to offer protection for those that were on the inside. And what's interesting about this is that the word for pitch is actually the same root word for the word atone. In fact, every other time you see this word in the Old Testament, it's translated as atonement. This idea of something being paid for, covered, made right. Atonement is what happens when you go out to eat and someone offers to pay your meal, that that I'll cover this for you. It's what we talk about when we talk about the cross. That Jesus paid the price for our sin, his life in exchange for ours. And this is why it's so interesting. Because over and over we're told that what happened in the days of Noah is going to happen again. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24. He says this in uh, verse 36, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be 
the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, what happened back then is going to happen again. Just as there was evil then, there is evil now. And just as there was a day of judgment then, there is another day that is coming. But this is the difference. That unlike in the days of Noah, we are not responsible for our means of salvation. Noah had to build his own ark. He had to cover it himself, and by faith he was obedient in doing so. But this is the hope of the gospel. The good news that we hold on to today, that our hope is not found in a wooden ark, but it is found in a wooden cross. Jesus is the ark. He is the way of salvation. We are covered and insulated and protected, not by the pitch of the ship, but by his atoning work on the cross. The price that he paid for you and for me. And this is our role as the church today, to do what Noah did all those years ago. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, where he talks about uh, Noah as a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. In other words, that Noah was not just building this giant box and gathering up animals, but he was preaching to anybody that would listen. People would come to him and they would make fun of him and scoff and, and ask questions and tell him he was wasting his life. And in response, he would preach the same message every day for 120 years. Rain is coming. The storm is coming. And there is only one shelter, only one stronghold that is big enough and strong enough and secure enough to hold you. Just get in the ark. It's not too late. We have room for you. Just turn back to God. His arms are open wide. This is the gospel message that we will all experience God as either the ark of salvation or the waters of judgment. And just as was true of Noah, God is standing right here, offering grace through the work of his son. He's saying, just get on the ark. I've got space just for you. Let me offer you protection. Let me make you an heir. Let me make you a part of my family. This is the invitation that God gives to you today the faith that he invites us to live in, to just get on the ark, to give your life to Christ, to rest in the knowledge that when we do, that he will keep us safe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you have promised us in your word. Lord, we thank you that, that you are our means of salvation, that you are the ark that we can rest in. Lord, today I ask that you would reveal to us what it means to walk closer to you, what you are calling us to do, how we can be light even in a dark world. Father, allow us today to rest in the knowledge that you will bring us through this. We ask this in your name. Amen.